Thanks for joining us today. We're going to talk about bulletproofing your transaction, the due diligence process. We're particularly going to talk about this with relation to uh, commercial transactions and investment property transactions. I want to make sure that everybody can hear me okay. If you can, can you click on the little yes button on the uh, under participants, the little green check mark. Okay, looks like at least a couple of you can, so hopefully the rest of you can as well. Okay. Great, awesome. All right, so let me get started. Uh, a little background for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm the broker of Central 21 Kime in Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey. I'm also a professor at Lea University. I do a lot of teaching and training for commercial investment real estate. Uh, we do some interesting things uh, with helping people to understand how to price uh, small properties like skyscrapers. And as an example, a few months ago before the quarantine, I had a group of our students able to tour and go on the roof of the newest skyscraper in Park Avenue. In fact, I think it's the only one built on Park Avenue in the last 60 years. Uh, they investigated the entire building, did our due diligence on that building. Uh, we always have great events going on uh, when we're not quarantined, of course. This is an event we did in Manhattan a few months ago regarding uh, WeWork and other shared office space users and how to apply that in other areas of the country. We actually have a great team at our company of shared office space consultants that are helping some of the property owners in our region anyway to switch from single tenant to shared space. Uh, some of the great people you'll see in the uh, panel include John, John Cobb on the far left. He's the executive VP of Ventas. Um, two over from him is uh, David Letty from U.S. Realty Property Trust. Uh, the gentleman between them is um, one of the principals in the REIT that owns uh, the, um, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it. Very, very tall building there, Empire State Building, sorry, that everybody knows in Manhattan. Uh, this is a photo of some of the commercial leaders that uh, we have in some of our training. In the center of this, so it's actually me in the center of that, in the center of this one is Tara Stakem. She's in charge of leasing at one of, at, uh, one of the World Trade Center buildings, uh, one of the top uh, commercial realtors in Manhattan. And Mark Holliday next to her, who is the CEO of SL Green, the biggest owner of skyscrapers in Manhattan. And the reason I point this out is that whether somebody is trying to sell a skyscraper or whether they're trying to uh, sell a small shopping center, community shopping center, or a four unit residential apartment building, we go through the same processes. In residential, if you were selling a row home in Allentown or a four bedroom, two and a half bath colonial or a 10,000 square foot mansion, what's the difference in the inspections that you do? There, there really are none. It's just inspecting a larger area. The same is true for commercial real estate, investment real estate, but it's a lot more complicated than just having a home inspection. So I always like to start by asking why we need due diligence to protect the buyer and seller. We want to avoid unnecessary risks. And usually I do this in a hall with lots of people around. So I have to do this actually uh, without getting as much input as I'd usually like. But we want to avoid unnecessary risks. We want to avoid possible losses. Uh, undisclosed repairs are huge, and we want to avoid the, law, the risk of a lawsuit. The problem is most of us spend too much time just doing what we call ocular investigation. And when I say ocular investigation, what I mean is eyeballing it and hoping that we don't miss anything major that comes up later. And I'm going to go through a lot of horror stories today, a lot of horror stories that people lost a lot of money on, across the country and in different areas, specifically some right here in Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and how we can avoid them going forward and how we can try and hopefully uh, get your property to settlement without having issues coming back after you later with lawsuits and losses for your clients. Where we go wrong too often is we tend to ready, fire, aim. We're so attached to our concept that we can't see beyond it. We think that our program is gonna work Anything that we're going to put together is going to work because uh, we know it better than anybody else. We move too fast. Many investors want to rush the study phase so they can get on with their plan or their project. We need to make sure there are no hidden defects or threats to the purchase. And we may be able to identify opportunities as well. And too often we do diligence ourselves. We discount problems. We believe in ourselves rather than experts. And I'll 
mention some of the mistakes I've made, or we try to do diligence on the cheap. You know, why lenders insist on using independent assessments is because they want to reduce the risk of missing issues that will be costly later. You should be doing the same thing. The other place that we go wrong is we follow, uh, have ourselves surrounded by yes men or yes women or yes persons. Don't surround yourself with those who tell you what you want to hear. Groupthink has led to failures in every part of our industry. Look for that differing opinion and hire professionals. Due diligence can mean finding hidden defects, but it can also mean finding hidden opportunities and hidden return on an investment. Knowing what's wrong puts your buyer in a better uh, negotiating position, and research may also uncover value-added opportunities to enhance the property's return. I'm gonna give you some examples of those as well. And remember that finding issues early leads to less expense and possibly the gratitude of your clients, which can become a unique selling proposition for you and your personal business. I wanna dispel a myth. Building or due diligence is not a building inspection. It's not just a building inspection, and it's not going out of your way to mess up a deal. We certainly have to do mechanical and structural reviews to see if there's anything that might be a concern. We also wanna look at environmental issues that may come back to bite us and be quite expensive. One of the big things that we tend to ignore are financial reviews and audits and lease reviews. And I'll talk about some horror stories with that. Title issues, zoning and permitted uses, market feasibility, and some mortgage underwriting requirements. These are all things that we have to look at as part of our due diligence to get a commercial transaction to settlement. And do the research and then renegotiate the deal, but don't lose the deal. We don't want it torn up. This might be funny to some of you. Some of you might not find it funny, but we don't want the deal torn up. We want to actually keep it together one way or another. In negotiation, you've got balance and benefits. You know, the most aggressive brokers and buyers are usually not the ones that seal the deal. A successful negotiation for a great asset requires a careful balance of all parties that includes benefits to both sides. One of the people I mentioned earlier was Mark uh, Holiday, who's the SEO, CEO of SL Green. And they're the largest owner of skyscrapers in Manhattan. And he is a tough negotiator, and he makes sure that he does the best he can for his firm. At the same time, he's fair to all parties. So parties that sell him buildings often come back later to sell him another one because they know he's going to be fair with them and he's going to treat them the right way. In negotiation, every transaction is unique. There is no one size fits all technique for any transaction. Now I'm going to go through with you later a due diligence checklist, which I can email you if you'd like a copy of it. But you try and figure out what's going to fit this particular uh, project and property. You may know the motivations, options, and ultimate goals of your particular client if you're a realtor but you will likely not know those of the other party than transaction. And for the best outcome, you need to discover uh, the other party's needs, motivations, and goals during the negotiation process. By the way, if I start losing uh, sound for some reason, put the little X up or something like that. I know I've been uh, getting this warning that says I'm having an unstable connection, which would be frustrating. Negotiation, you want to keep and earn each other's trust, no matter how challenging the negotiation, always be truthful to all parties and be loyal to your party. Whoever you're representing, that's who you represent. That's your fiduciary obligation to them. Explain to all parties early in the transaction that the due diligence period may uncover issues that may need to be resolved or negotiated, and that our goal is never to wear down or beat up one party or the other, but rather to ensure in the end that all parties have a fair outcome that benefits both. That trust you build in the beginning will help you to carry the transaction through to the end and will allow you to work with both sides again in future transactions. I can't tell you how many clients I've had over the years that were on the other side of the table in a transaction. And ultimately, they called me for their next deal because they liked how I handled the transaction for my party, for the, how I represented my clients, and how I did everything fairly. So make sure you are truthful to all parties and work in everyone's interest if you can. Due diligence is about doing your homework. And unfortunately, commercial real estate brokers often barely scratch the surface when conducting their due diligence, creating risk of the client's investment as well as risk of litigation. There are so many agents that come into the real estate industry that uh, flash and do really well right in the beginning, and then later get into more and more and more trouble because they didn't cover their tracks when they were doing it. They were putting deals together. They were slick talkers. 
But the idea is you've got to make sure that you're covering everything that needs to be covered because otherwise you're going to lead yourself into lawsuits and have a process in place on every transaction to avoid issues. And that's where a checklist comes into play. If you get hauled into court, good luck if you tell a judge that you didn't know there was a problem or that you didn't direct your client to a knowledgeable expert. It's going to be assumed that you were trying to get your commission rather than taking your fiduciary obligations to your client seriously. Keep that in mind. Um, we talk a lot in our company about a, a suit that happened last year where a, a person walked into a property that was vacant that we had on the market. In my mind, that's called trespassing fell on the property and sued us. And in court, the questions we got asked to make us look silly were incredible. If you do miss something, you have to own up to it. But if you are just trying to get the deal done, you could end up being subject to litigation later. And that's why I try and make sure you understand that. Now I'm gonna focus on three types of transactions, straight commercial investment purchase, whether it's a multifamily or whether it's a, a strip mall or an office building or a warehouse reconfiguring or redeveloping property or even rebranding it. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about real estate development and some of the nuances of, of due diligence during that as well. This is what we call the life cycle of real estate uh, property. I didn't develop this. This is actually from a book called The Real Estate Development in Matrix by uh, Daniel and Kimberly Kohlhoppen of the Johns Hopkins Carey Business School. And I like it because it really lays out what happens with property over time. It starts with somebody holding on to a piece of land. It might be a farm or it might be a corner somewhere that they just let sit until at some point development gets to the point where that land becomes more valuable. And then somebody picks up the ball, whether it's the original owner or someone who buys it from them and packages it. That means getting a title uh, survey, getting it approved for a particular use, like putting a CVS on the corner or putting a warehouse on the parcel. They get approvals, and then they may flip it over to a land developer. The land developer puts in the horizontal improvements, the roads, the uh, retention ponds, um, bringing in the water and sewer and electric. Once those horizontal improvements are in, the same developer or a different developer comes in and puts in the structures, the warehouse, the CVS, whatever they're building. And then they may hold on to that property, or more often than not, those developers turn around and sell it to an investor or a building operator who holds on to that property for a long period of time and makes money on the return on that property. And at some point it gets old and tired and needs to be renovated. And when it needs to be renovated, somebody comes in and redevelops the property and it starts all over again. And at every stage of this, value is created. Value is created in holding on to land. Value is created in getting zoning approvals. Value is created in putting the uh, curbs in and the roads and the sidewalks and everything that needs to be done with it. Built, built, uh, buildings are built on it. That's all part of the process of actually creating value. Um, so give you a quick example to start with. This was a project in Miami that imploded. They have a $100 million project they were building on the waterfront for 600 condo units. It was going to be great. They did all their due diligence up front. They received their approvals. They settled on buying the property for $8 million. They put a few million dollars into the zoning, into the improvements, and started their process of digging to build and ran into a circle of holes that might or might not have been carved by the Tequista Indians, and they got an injunction against building. That's what it looked like, uh, as sad as that may be. And if you read some of the press, a lot of the press came down on the developers saying, well, the developer knew the risks that were going in. It's too bad if he loses millions and millions of dollars. And this is what the village may have looked like at one point in time, 200 years before. Ultimately, what happened, the builder got lucky in this case, that the state came in and paid them 27 million, which was their cost they invested to get to that point for the site and then turned it into a nice park overlooking the water. It also would have been 600 really nice looking condos overlooking the water had they been able to finish it. In most cases, the developer never gets their money back out of it, or the commercial buyer never gets their money back out of it. It's a straight loss, and many, it creates many bankruptcies. But you can run into almost any situation, and you have to be prepared for that. This is an extreme situation, but it can happen. So there are two times we get to study the property. One is pre-contract, and one is after we get an agreement together. 
So pre-contract is from the time an investment property or commercial property hits the market. You may have a real limited period of time to submit a letter of intent, but you can do some research at the same time you're looking at the property, scheduling a showing, and writing up the offer. You can check on zoning. You can request income and expenses from the owner. You can hopefully get copies of leases from them if you're buying an apartment building or an office building. And then once you actually have it under contract, then there's the formal due diligence period. In the PAR commercial contract, there's actually a 30-day window built in. You can extend that sometimes. It's unusual to be able to get more than 60 days unless you're going for zoning variances and trying to redevelop the property. But that due diligence period of 30 to maybe 60 days allows you to try and find anything that could be wrong with it that may end up costing you a lot of money. But start your due diligence before you even write the agreement. Don't waste your time until you have an idea that you can actually go forward with it. And these are some of the major steps in due diligence. We talk about the legal due diligence of the property, uh, financial due diligence, whether or not the leases actually reflect what they're claiming in the multilist, physical and engineering due diligence, including inspections, environmental, operational due diligence, I'll explain close to the end. And sometimes we have to do a market, market feasibility study to figure out if we can actually accomplish what we want to accomplish. Is our project really going to work there? And whether or not we're going to get community support for it. So I'm going to start quickly with legal due diligence. And I know I'm talking fast, but I have a lot of stuff I want to cover with you. I always tell you to hire an attorney. That's actually me. Uh, I'm not an attorney, so hire somebody who's a professional. And I know that many of you are going to say the same thing. Why hire an attorney? What do attorneys do anyway? That's right. They screw up the deal. Well, that's not true if you get the right one. You don't want to hire a general practitioner. You want somebody who's got experience in real estate development or in commercial investment uh, real estate. If you're not referred to an attorney, then ask for references and examples of what they've done if you do select one. And you're not looking for a deal breaker. You're looking for somebody who's not a pushover. You want somebody experienced who knows the business. Again, not a general practitioner, but somebody who's help, going to help you put the deal together rather than pick it apart. We all know those attorneys who want to be right all the time rather than actually come to a, a deal for their clients. So not just any attorney. We don't want a deal breaker. Arguing makes them feel powerful and they go overboard to protect the client's interest to the detriment of the client's investment. But at the same time, we don't want a pushover goes along to get along. Some of the things we look for when we're doing legal uh, feasibility are title encumbrances, and I'm going to give you some great examples. Those are limitations on or liabilities against the real estate, and it's not just mortgages. There can be deed restrictions, easements we didn't know about, people encroaching on the property, uh, licenses to use the property. We look for title exceptions or restrictive covenants. We look for leases that are existing on the ground that we didn't know about. We look for option contracts. Maybe somebody has a gas right underneath the property, or maybe somebody has coal rights if we're up in Schuylkill County. Zoning or subdivision, whether or not we actually meet what we want to put in that project. If there are any pending assessments, now keep in mind, somebody's selling this property, and often there's a reason they're selling. Is there something coming down the pike like a pending assessment that they don't want to be there for? We also want the attorney to review the leases, check for the actual rents, the expiration dates, unusual clauses, and obtain what we call estoppel certificates, which I'll circle back around to. And sometimes we want surveys as well. Here's an example. We found a great commercial property in the Leah Valley market for a bank a few years ago. And the bank went through all the due diligence phases, including zoning, phase one inspections, soil tests, and so on and held off on doing the title search until the very end. Well, why spend the money on a title search when you're not sure if zoning will be approved, right? But in this case, title came up with a deed restriction that, put, uh, that was put on by a prior owner, several owners back, that the site could never be used for a bank because the prior owner, several owners back, had been a bank and they didn't want a competitor to buy it. That property changed hands in between, but the sale completely imploded because we couldn't remove the deed restriction. And it cost the buyer quite a lot of money in all the research they did up to the point of doing the title search, which only would have cost them about 150 bucks. We've run into at least one other deed restriction that presented, prevented a property from being used as a bank and a few other uses because it had been owned by a church next door and the church didn't want a bank near them. There are lots of things that can come up. We want to make sure that we don't run into them.
You also sometimes run into what we call non-compete clauses or use clauses. If we're representing a tenant that wants to go into a shopping center, there may be a non-compete in that shopping center for opening whatever your tenant is planning on putting in there. Let's say, for example, your tenant wants to do a bagel and coffee shop, but someone else in that shopping center has the unlimited rights to sell coffee and no one else in that shopping center is allowed to. We've run into this type of situation. We want to make sure that anything we want to put in a space uh, is not restricted that we can actually put it there. And then anything that we are putting in, we want to make sure that we protect ourselves as well. And if we open a Dunkin' Donuts, we don't want Starbucks right next door if we can help it. Undisclosed easements are another problem we run into sometimes where there's a paper alley behind a property or someone has the right to use a property. This is one we came into uh, recently, if I remember this correctly. And the, if memory serves, I think this particular parcel the buyer was planning on doing a um, winery on it. And it turned out there was an easement across the property that curved through it for two properties in the back that we did not know were there until we actually pulled a title on it. There are lots of things that can come up once you start researching a property. There are also restrictions sometimes against tearing down a structure. We've had a few of them over the years where the property was deed restricted against tearing down a building that's on the property. Uh, in this case, we had to build around it and incorporate the original structure into what was being built. Would have been much cheaper to just tear down. But you've got to investigate this stuff ahead of time because sellers are not always forthcoming and honest. And in some, in some cases, these properties are being sold as estates by the heirs to the property. And they don't know as much about the nuances of the property as perhaps the owner did. Title encumbrances are something we find out when we're looking at a title report. You wanna make sure there are no clouds in the title that would affect the ownership, including easements, uh, loans that may not be satisfied of record. There could be loans from 20 or 30 years ago that never got satisfied. Uh, recorded leases against the property. Mineral, oil, or gas rights being sold off or anything else. So you wanna obtain a full title report. Are there any encumbrances or exceptions? You wanna search for any restrictive covenants and make sure there are no development rights transferred. We had a property in Lehigh Township, Pennsylvania last, uh, a few years ago, where the owner claimed it was a very buildable parcel, looked great. The uh, buyer of the property did meet with the township, told the township what they wanted to do there, which was a horse boarding facility, which is a commercial use, by the way. And the township uh, looked at it favorably waited until after settlement, and then the township pulled a copy of the plans and realized that this was a remainder parcel that was uh, restricted from ever being built on as part of a larger project. This was set aside as open space, and it became a problem. You wanna make sure that there are no undisclosed easements, uh, and that's, by the way, development rights. There are many places across Pennsylvania and New Jersey where the development rights to a parcel have been sold off for promising the state that that parcel would remain open forever as open space. And the owner got paid for that in many cases. So you can't just remove that restriction. Verify that all mineral rights remain with the property and potentially obtain a survey to verify all access points to the property and verify accessibility from municipal or state uh, roads for ingress and egress. We had a property uh, in the Nazareth area uh, about six months ago that was a car dealership and the person who wanted to buy it had a small trucking firm that was bringing storage containers in and out with uh, small tractor trailers. Well, I should say tractor trailers. It turned out that even though this was a commercially zoned highway commercial parcel, and even though there were a lot of cars on the property with a big parking area, ultimately PennDOT would not allow them to use it for bringing tractor trailers in and out because they felt it was too dangerous being as close to the corner as it was and they had a certain type of license to bring cars in, but not a license to have tractor trailers coming in and out. And that sale imploded as well. But you wanna know these things before someone spends a lot of money on a property. And in this case, I don't think the owner did actually know what was wrong with it. Zoning and usage. Verify that you've got proper zoning and hopefully obtain a zoning letter from the municipality. Verify that they're not uh, planning on rezoning a particular parcel or making changes to zoning that could affect your property that you're selling or buying. Verify that all certificate of occupancies are up to date, including COs for tenant spaces. In many areas, this is very common in New York and Northern Jersey, every space in a shopping center, every space in an office building 
has its own certificate of occupancy. And if you're transferring that building, you need copies of the certificate of occupancies for all of them. Otherwise, you as the buyer become liable for making sure those spaces are brought up to uh, current codes. Verify any improvements comply with government authorities. If uh, an addition was put on a building, if any improvements were made to it, make sure that uh, the local government authority was aware of it and it was approved. Review licenses and permits to verify there's no breach of licenses. Uh, check that they're all in the current owner's name and that they're transferable, that there's no contemplated assessments or planning on putting sidewalks in or new sewer lines that are gonna cost a small fortune. Verify there's no pending administrative procedures or government plans or government studies. And verify there's no utility moratorium. Um, there have been several places we've had clients want to build projects over the years. And we had one uh, probably 15 years ago that a developer was putting a commercial project in, bought and settled on the land before realizing that there was a moratorium on sewer and that it would take them three years to build the new sewer plant that would actually service that area. Even though there were sewer lines right in front of the building, they couldn't tap in. Because of that, this particular property sat and the guy paid on it for three years until the sewer lines were actually uh, reconnected, were actually being able to be used. This is a situation in Whitehall, Pennsylvania, where uh, it, I believe, went to court. You'll see on the bottom right-hand corner, for those people who are in this particular market, there's Lea Valley Mall and the Whitehall Mall. And up a little further on the right-hand side is Walmart Supercenter. And across from that is currently MacArthur Town Center. That hadn't been there not too many years ago. That was an orchard. It was zoned highway commercial, and uh, by right, they could put a shopping center there with no problem. So uh, a Kmart developer bought the property, planned out the shopping center. The township got wind of it, and without somebody coming and suing me for what I'm saying now, changed the zoning to disallow it from being done. The attorney for the shopping center came into the hearing and brought along a stenographer to sit down in front of the board members and told the board members that uh, he was going to sue each of them personally if they turned it down because they had changed the zoning in his mind illegally. At some point, of course, it was turned down. Uh, it went through a lot of issues and ultimately the shopping center was built and there is a Lowe's Home Improvement Center there now. These are the types of things that we can run into. This is a property in West Allentown and the second floor of this is the West End Youth Center. The first floor was a wedding venue. They had parties and events and weddings. There are, if I recall, 23 parking spaces or 27 parking spaces on this lot. The downstairs would hold 150 people. So at a wedding, there'd be maybe 150 people and cars would park all up and down the streets around this. You can see it's in a residential neighborhood. So a gentleman wanted to buy this particular property and put a uh, physician's office on the first floor and keep the second floor of the West End Youth Center. Now it should be a no brainer to have a doctor, two nurses, um, a coding person and a receptionist in a building with three or four patients when you can have 150 people at a wedding. But the city turned it down because based on their zoning, you needed X number of parking spaces per thousand square feet of building and there weren't sufficient parking spaces. So it was turned down. It was appealed, it was turned down and then it went before city council and ultimately, they did get an approval and it's now a doctor's office on the first floor. But what seems to be a really simple zoning issue sometimes isn't. So you wanna make sure there is sufficient parking for the current use or the proposed use. You wanna make sure all the structures are within the setback areas or is there a written variance to allow what they have there now? And you may even wanna meet with the neighbors to determine any ongoing issues. In this case, the neighbors were thrilled that there weren't gonna be as many cars parked all over the neighborhood every weekend as there had been in the past. But unfortunately, many zoning offices follow the letter of their rules and don't allow it. And you may have multiple layers of permits needed. We may need a site plan review and an environmental impact review, a water management district review, regional impact review, zoning change, land use revision plan, and so on. And the rules and criteria involve interpretation by the authorities. So there's a situation in uh, eastern Pennsylvania where a particular municipality that shall remain nameless was allowing a bank to go up on a very uh, high traffic corner. And the township read the Boca codes at that time, they've now been rebranded, but read the codes nationally to state 
that a building should have a sprinkler system throughout the building. The bank was putting in a fireproof vault and the township required them to drill into the fireproof vault and run the sprinkler system into the fireproof vault. Now, of course, a fireproof vault, the whole purpose of it is it's not going to burn inside or out. And that's to protect papers from getting soaked by a sprinkler or from burning. This went round and round for months. Everybody hired attorneys. Everybody had engineers and argued and screamed at public meetings. And ultimately, the bank caved because they needed to get that branch open because it sat there with them paying on it. And they drilled through the fireproof vault to put in these sprinkler systems. So it all depends on interpretation sometimes as well. And neighbors can also become a problem at some hearings because they tend to be resistant to change. We call it the NIMBY factor, not in my backyard. So negotiation is a critical skill important to building supportive authorities and citizens around you in advance. And a negative decision can kill a project in one meeting, no matter how much money you've put into it. This is a great example, and I'll get back to specifically what you need to do. This is a great example on um, uh, 8th Avenue in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, of how much additional value might be created by changing the use. For those of you from that region, uh, this is the Durkee Spice Plant. It was an industrial piece next to a railroad bed, but it was also next to uh, the intersection of uh, two divided roads, a highway route 378 and the 8th Avenue uh, divided road as well. Great spot for a shopping center. Typically, you can downgrade zoning in most areas. It was zoned heavy industrial. It's surrounded by, by houses, so it would make sense that changing it to retail wouldn't be a big deal. So Lowe's bought the property, tried to develop it, and was turned down because, unfortunately, there are too many people in, in the offices that believe it has to stay what the zoning says. And in this case, they really believed in the Northeast that high uh, paying manufacturing jobs would come back if we just left that piece zoned industrial. After a few years of going round and round trying to get this piece approved, Lowe's gave up and sold the property to a guy named uh, J.G. Petrucci. Some of you may be familiar with him in Northern Jersey. Uh, Petrucci came in and sprinkled the audience with people that had bright yellow shirts saying, say yes to Lowe's. And he went back in with the exact same plan and said, I want to build a Lowe's on that property and lease it back to Lowe's. And the city, of course, turned him down. And Petrucci said, no problem. I've got a plan B. Plan B is you can't stop me from doing a use that's permitted by right. And since it's industrial, I can make that a junkyard. And we're not going to hire anybody. And maybe we'll pile cars, 10 cars high. I don't know exactly what he said. But he talked about what he could put there and was instead saying that if you don't allow this to happen, I'm going to use your own zoning against you and I'm going to put something there that's incredibly ugly and not going to create jobs. And they ultimately approved the site and he turned around and created value and leased it back to Lowe's. So these are the types of things that can happen with any sort of property. Where legal feasibility and financial feasibility meet have to do with the leases. Have you ever had a situation, if you've been in real estate a while, where the actual leases didn't quite match the terms of the, or rent uh, offered by the landlord that the landlord provided to you. We run into that a little too often. What we wanna do when we're looking at the leases, and maybe this is something that you as a real estate professional does, maybe it's something that an attorney does, but you wanna look for the actual contact, contract rent. You also wanna look at the move in and move out dates. When are they planning on moving out or when is the end date of their lease? what are the renewal options and what are the renewal rates? They may be locked in at a low rate forever. You have to be very careful of what's in there as a renewal. Uh, rent abatements during the term of lease or during the renewal. A rent abatement is a period of free rent. So when you try and get a tenant into a space, let's say I want a, a tenant to go into a shopping center and I tell the tenant I'm gonna give them three months free rent in that shopping center if they take the space now that three months free might be up front, or it might be one month up front, one month in three years, and one month in five years. The buyer of that property wants to know when they're not getting paid. They wanna know what those options are that are in there. We wanna know if there's a security deposit to transfer. I hate it when somebody settles on a property and finds out later that the former owner held on to the security deposit. We also wanna look for something called tenant relocation options. Let's say you're trying to put a store in a shopping center where Target is in the middle. Target will have a clause in their lease saying that they can expand if they need the additional space 
and that the owner of the shopping center has to relocate those tenants. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you opened your pizza shop next to Target and Target decides to expand and you have to relocate? You have to understand what's in those leases and what that may entail. Are there any termination options that any of the tenants have? Are there required tenant refurbishment or tenant improvements? Many leases have in them that we're going to give them a certain dollar per square foot up front to renovate their space, and that in five years or seven years, we're going to give them an additional amount per square foot to refurbish that space. Anybody buying that property that's expecting to get a certain income that suddenly gets hit with a $20,000 bill for refurbishment wants to know that before they settle. And if there's a problem that comes up later, they're going to come after you as the realtor for not finding that for them. And that's one of the reasons we hire an attorney in many cases. Any other stipulations of the lease? And you want to compare the square footage between leases and rent roll. You also want to prepare tenant estoppel certificates. Now, an estoppel certificate is a document we get signed by the tenants confirming the terms of the lease as they understand them, including the amount of rent, the security deposit, and the expiration of the lease. That solves the problem of somebody arguing after you settle on the property. And that certificate may also give the opportunity to the tenant to state whether or not they have any claims against the landlord, whether there are any issues, and perhaps that's why that landlord is looking at selling. And then taking it a step further with financial due diligence, we want to, of course, verify the property's current cash flow, its long-term cash flow. We want to make sure the seller's representations of income and expenses match the real-world income and expenses. I know none of you have ever run into a situation where a landlord has said there's no expense at all. It can be done with a series of audit, audits, but also it's a good idea to build a financial model. And it doesn't take long and it scares many commercial realtors, but it's not hard to do if you have the right software. So you wanna collect documents and try and build a model to show the buyer what they're really making on this particular property. And it's usually more than they expect over the holding period. Our goal is to be certain of the stability of the property and growth of the property. Now, these are a couple of different software packages we can use. Analyst Pro is uh, one that uh, CCIM pushes. It's a good package. It has a, a, a cell phone app that allows you to, to uh, use it on the cell phone. Um, I think it's about $1,000 a year. I know Century 21 agents get it for around 500 bucks a year. CCIM members get it for around 500 bucks a year. Uh, it's a nice piece of software. Realnex is another one. We use Realnex in our office. It allows you to build a 10-year projection of the property and show you what the property is really making a return uh, with a nice, uh, easy to fill in form. And it actually calculates it out, prints some spectacular reports. And of course, if you're working with any institutional investors, they want us to use a software program called Argus, which takes a lot of work to learn. We have that as well, but that's a lot harder to learn. This is what a typical annual property operating data statement looks like. So what we look at is on the left-hand side, we're trying to figure out what this property is actually making over time. So we try and get all the rents to get together, add them up, and we come up with a gross scheduled income. We might take out a vacancy rate, so we have a gross operating income. We estimate what the expenses are. We pull the actual expenses from last year. That becomes our total operating expenses. And we get what we call our NOI, our net operating income. That first year snapshot is what most investors are really concerned about. But if you can plug those few numbers into a software package like Realnex or, um, or uh, Analyst Pro, you're going to be able to take these and have the software project them with a little bit of inflation over a 10-year holding period. And if you have a mortgage on the property, you can plug that in as well and show how the mortgage is paid down, how the value of the building goes up, and how the rents increase over time in relation to the expenses and how much more that property is worth at the end and then it'll calculate for you what you really made over that 10 year period, not that first year snapshot, and show people why it's so important to uh, invest in real estate as opposed to something else. Because you're paying down the mortgage and so forth. The other thing you can do with one of these is you can plot out the timing of lease expirations and rollovers. If a lease expiration occurs during a high leasing season, the, the property may even release at a higher rate. You can show that to a client. And again, it takes honestly 15, 20 minutes to plug these into software to make it work. Some of the things you're gonna look for in these leases, of course, are what is the real rent and what are the escalations? Is it going up 3% a year? Is it not going up at all? And if the rent is escalating, is it a fixed rate of increase or is it tied to some index? 
And then again, rent abatements we talked about, are there any in there that's a reduction in the base rent or advertised rent by giving uh, free time in the building? And are there any tenant improvements or space refurbishment that's built into the lease? At some point during the ownership of this property, are you going to have to pay as the buyer to refurbish that space? And is it already hard coded into the leases? Because you wanna figure that as a cost you're gonna to have to deal with. You also wanna review the records uh, of expenses because the owner on the multi-list is gonna give you what they call their operating expenses. And they're almost never going to be as much as they're actually spending. You wanna reconcile those operating expenses and see if there's anything that's come up over the last few years that you think is gonna become an ongoing expense. You also wanna look if the tenants are reimbursing you for any of those expenses. We call them common area maintenance fees or CAM fees. What additional money is the tenant paying you? And you wanna check if any of the tenants are behind in payments if any tenant has a history of late payments, and is there a reason they're late? Because if a lot of spaces go dark, and we're experiencing that right now in this quarantine, where many landlords of shopping centers and small office buildings are terrified that if they lose 20% of their tenants, suddenly the building is losing a lot of money. Some of these investors will buy a nice shopping center at a, an 8% cap rate, an 8% uh, cash on cash return. And purchase the building expecting a return. And if a lot of the tenants go under, suddenly they are upside down in their uh, transaction. And what are the tenants responsibility for expenses? What building expenses are paid by the landlord and what's paid by the tenant? Is the tenant being charged a percentage of common area maintenance? So for example, and I don't wanna get into the weeds in this because this is a different program, but if a tenant occupies 10% of the rentable space in the building, are they paying 10% of the cost of the expenses back? In many office buildings, many shopping centers, you take the entire cost of operating that building, the uh, plowing of the parking lot, the uh, trash cans out back, the uh, maintenance of the building, the electric in the building, and you share it backward to the tenants, the taxes, insurance, you share it backward to the tenants in the form of common area maintenance fees. That's a fairly common thing in commercial real estate. In residential real estate, Typically the landlord pays the taxes and insurance and exterior maintenance, and the tenant ends up paying for the utilities. If they are paying back the CAM fees, are there any caps on those reimbursements? And there are lots of different types of caps that end up in leases. We call some expense stops, we call some base stops. An expense stop is a limit on how much somebody is paying towards expenses, and it can be on either party. And a real quick example is, if there's an expense stop where the landlord pays a certain amount of the expenses up to a, a, a number and the tenant pays above that, that's generally in the lease. So for example, a lease may state that a tenant pays a rental rate of $24 per square foot per year, as long as the expenses don't exceed $8 per square foot per year of rentable area. And then the tenant pays their proportional share of the expenses above that. So if you've got a 100,000 square foot building, and the landlord is gonna be responsible for eight bucks per square foot. That's 800,000 in annual expenses the landlord pays. If the actual cost is a million dollars, landlord is, is capped at 800,000, and this can work in reverse, it can be the tenants capped. If the overage is a uh, million dollars, the actual expense is a million dollars minus the 800,000 landlord's paying, the tenants are responsible for the other 200,000, and generally that is broken back to the tenants based on their percentage of occupancy. So if a tenant is occupying 20,000 square feet of 100,000 square foot building, they're responsible for 20% of the square footage or uh, $40,000. And you have to make sure that those tenants are actually paying them. Um, some of the other financial things we look at, we wanna review the rent rolls. We wanna review any amendments to leases. Again, estoppel certificates. We wanna look at the accounts receivable and any delinquencies to see if there are any tenants that are consistently not paying or are behind. We'd love to see a balance sheet for three years and a check register to see if they're not putting everything on their balance sheet, some of the expenses they, they put out. We wanna look at uh, sales histories for tenants. Now, the only reason we would do that is if we have what's called a percentage lease. In shopping centers, uh, very often the landlord also gets a percentage of sales over a certain number. So we look at sales histories. We review tax bills and any capital expenditures. Uh, over every year, there may be a little bit of money going into the parking lot or into a roof or something else. Maybe they're just patching it because there's something coming up that's going to have to be fixed. Uh, we want to look at the tenant security deposits, 
if there's any outstanding cost for tenant improvements, any leasing commissions that have to be paid if any tenants renew. Sometimes right in the lease, it states that a real estate commission of let's say 5% of the entire lease amount is being paid up front for a three year lease. And if the lease is renewed in three years, that realtor gets an additional 3% or something like that. Again, you wanna understand that so that the person buying it knows what their costs are gonna be going forward. We wanna look at utility records, uh, any current invoices for contract providers, look at what the insurance quote is, and any loss report from the insurance company for the last three years. Loss reports are invaluable because you find problems that owners don't disclose. And when we're looking at service contracts like third party maintenance providers, landscapers, snow removal, phone, internet, sometimes we find opportunities to reduce cost as well as securing the best options for a building. And the cost analysis, we wanna look at the historical operations. Uh, the cost provides an insight into maybe cost savings or pitfalls we have to look for. We wanna compare expenses with comparable properties in the same region, similar age and similar construction. And if we were uh, looking at big, big properties, if we're working with institutional investors like pension funds, they actually have whole databases of metrics built in and they actually match up in a spreadsheet their expenses for a building they're buying versus their metrics to see if they're actually higher or lower than what's typical in their database. Now, most small investors don't do that. And in cost analysis, we wanna look at where we can reduce cost. If the property is staff heavy, heavy, can we renegotiate some of the contracts and replace that dumpster outside with a lower cost dumpster, replace our electric contract with a better deal, um, replace the insurance with something that uh, is a bit lower. Those are all areas where we might be able to save money. And some of our investors may be experiencing some irrational exuberance. We run into problems all the time. Back in San Francisco in, 19, in 2005 and 2006, uh, investors were buying everything in town and a lot of investors bought properties that were losing money every month. And they bought them at a loss because they felt, thought the growth rate in San Francisco would be so high that the rent would keep rising and outpace the losses and eventually they'd make money. And then of course, by 2007 in San Francisco, the market had crashed. Right now, there are buyers buying in New Jersey, multifamily, large multifamily properties at a 5% cap rate. Very, very low cap rate, very low return up front with the expectation that the income is going to grow quickly there and they're gonna be making more money over time. The challenge is if the market continues to be in a quarantine or, or resets and banks decide, investors decide, no, for this type of property, we won't buy it without at least an 8% return without an 8% cap rate, then the value of those properties go down and you wanna give your clients the best advice you can so they can back to you over and over again. You want them to buy the property, of course, but you wanna provide them with solid advice as well. This is an example, I won't tell you who brought us the deal. This is not the picture of the real building, but on the surface, this looked like a really good deal. Uh, a CVS with a cap rate of 7.5%. By the way, investors love CVSs because uh, they're like an annuity. You're always gonna get paid. It's like buying a bond. You're going to get that money and then in 29 years or whenever the lease is up, you own the building. So effectively a land lease. Now in this particular case, the investor was excited to find a CVS with a 7.5% cap rate that was on LoopNet. The problem was it was a dated CVS built many years ago. It had a smaller footprint than the typical CVS now. And it was in a, an urban location where market rents had actually declined and there was less than three years left on the lease. So in less than three years, that CVS, we're pretty sure, was going to move out of that space and whoever was going to re-rent it was not going to be a strong tenant like a CVS, and they were probably going to pay a much lower rate they'll be paying at market. And because of that, uh, that building was not worth what they were asking for it, even though on the surface it looked good. Now, I've heard investors say, I'm only making 5% today, but once I rent the other 35% of the vacant building, I'll be making this much. But maybe there's a reason when you're looking at some of these properties that it is 35% vacant. And maybe every property in the area is 35% vacant. And maybe there are two brand new buildings under construction down the street that are gonna drive your vacancy rate to 40%. So always look at the reality as well as the potential. You wanna make sure that you can actually uh, continue to make money over time, that there isn't something on the horizon. 
And merging due diligence with market analysis, you want to look at what properties compete with your project for tenants. Uh, what are the competing rates out there? If you have a small office building you're buying in Bethlehem, and you've got tenants that have been in there for 10 years and still have two years left in their leases, but they're above the rates of other buildings nearby. When those leases expire, your rates might go down. So what's competing with you? What are the typical finishes outside compared to yours? Are there properties in the planning or construction stages and how will that impact your occupancy rate? And would upgrading and repositioning your asset lead to a higher annual return and a higher return at the end of your holding period? Can you change it and fix it to make it worth more. And sometimes you can add value. Uh, is this part property the highest and best use? And I've said this many, many times. If you have a great corner commercial property, that's a few acres. CVS will pay more for that corner because they can make more for it than uh, Sheets or Wawa. And Sheets or Wawa will pay more for that corner than McDonald's or Burger King because CVS makes more per square foot than Wawa does and Wawa makes more per square foot than McDonald's does. So we want to look at whether or not we have the highest and best use in that corner, whether we can increase the income. You might also be able to increase income by putting something else on the property. There was a uh, farm we sold a number of years ago, a horse farm, boarding facility on Route 33. And um, it had two rentals on the property plus the boarding facility, which itself made a decent profit. The, uh, the buyer of the property was able to put a cell phone tower on it and two double-sided billboards on it as well as some storage buildings. All of those generated additional income, significantly additional income, that the prior owner had never even considered. Very often we don't look at the possibility of putting up a billboard or a cell tower or something else. We might also be able to reduce cost by doing energy audits. We might be able to rework spaces, update amenities, and release at higher rates. This is a building that Mark Holiday redid in New York, and I, this is on a grand scale, but again, you can look at a small property and do this, and you can look at a giant property and do this. On the left-hand side, you've got a Class B property. And this particular Class B property had columns in the building, which uh, kept you from being able to redefine the space. It had uh, older elevators. It had, of course, the look of an older building. And it was rented at a certain rate to tenants that were in there based on the fact that it was an older-looking building. Now, I don't remember the exact numbers on this, but let's say you bought a building like this for, oh, $350 million. And then you spend another $150 million changing it over to become more of a class A type building. And then release that space, raising the, the rental income by 50 or 60%, because now you're a class A property again, and you're able to get higher rents for that building. Now, instead of buying that building at, let's say, a 7% or an 8% cap rate, you're able to sell that building at a 5% cap rate with higher rents. Now that building that you may have paid 350 or $400 million for and put $100 million in renovations in is now worth a billion dollars. As an example, that's not the numbers in this particular building. You can do the same thing on a small scale, trying to renovate something and put it out there at a higher rate. Of course, the next step is physical due diligence, and I'll go through this pretty quickly. It's the building inspection, the property inspection, and engineering. Uh, we want to make sure the current condition is acceptable. We will have a building inspector look at the structure and the systems. We want to look at the life expectancy of the various components so we can budget for it. How long is the roof going to last? And what about the HVAC system? We want to review the original plans versus what it actually looks like today. And if there's been any work done, we want to call recent contractors to verify what they did and if anything else has to be done. I've had um, buildings where the HVAC system was shot. And they had just had a contractor in to fill up the Freon in the uh, unit in order to make it cool in there for the showing without actually replacing the system. You've got to check these things and inspect them. Some of the things we miss sometimes are mechanical system permits. If you've got an elevator in the building, are the permits up to date? Is, is the annual permit done? And there's a five-year load permit. And that's expensive. Fire panels, you have to have those inspected on a regular basis. Are they up to date? Are there any outstanding violations? We want to find that out from the municipality, the city, or the township. If we're selling a business or a building that has inventory or supplies, make sure you have a list and make that part of your purchase contract. And measure the building. Make sure that the size of each unit and the configuration actually matches what you're told they are. Because too often things have changed over time and you're guessing at what's there. You also want to look at service contracts. You want to make sure that uh, any work that was done was done properly recently. 
You want to pull an insurance report because you never know what's going to come up. Uh, if there's been damage to the building that insurance paid on, you want to make sure that that was taken care of and it's not something that's going to happen again. Uh, this is one in Center City, Allentown. If you, those of you who were from Allentown remember this. Beautiful building. It was built on 7th and Hamilton, uh, built over limestone, and uh, did not expect this to happen. But uh, a sinkhole opened up and actually collapsed the building. A couple of our realtors actually stood in the parking garage across the street and videotaped the building collapsing. Um, and by the way, insurance did not cover that. So even the idea of having a compaction test done to build a building like this would have been a really good idea. Now, of course, there's a hockey arena there. Some of the things we see very commonly are double tapped wires, where you've got two wires going into the same circuit breaker that breaks code and can be dangerous. That's a common problem. Uh, and I want to thank Liberty Inspections for giving us some of these. Uh, this is uh, the main beam of a building carved out to put a jack in. Not a real smart idea. That creates a very good possibility of that building coming in on itself. This is a building that I purchased uh, in Bethlehem Township. When I bought it, it had a three-year-old roof uh, that was supposed to be a 20-year-old, 20-year uh, roof life expectancy minimum. Uh, could be 30 or 40. The building leaked like crazy, went back to the, uh, and I never had it inspect, I never had the roof inspected because it had a three-year-old roof. So it was brand new, it was rolled on, it should be fine. I went back to the roofer and the roofer said, well, it's not a problem my roof, it's a problem with the seams and I don't cover that. So I went to a lot of trouble and had a lot of expense put into trying to fix this brand new roof on the building that I had bought. And it became quite expensive. By the way, a handyman did a better job on this than the roofer did. Just saying. This is a situation where you have termites in the main beam under a house or under a building. Uh, this was in an office building. You can see how wonderfully they took care of the filters in the HVAC system, which led to a failure in the HVAC system. Again, some of the uh, wonderful um, uh, filters. This is a building where uh, water had gotten behind the stucco. That cracking appeared in the stucco because it wasn't put on correctly. Water had gotten behind it, but you didn't see the water problem from the exterior. Doing some moisture tests and doing some core drilling through found that the structure inside had been compromised, and this was almost a $90,000 fix. Something that didn't appear to be a problem from the outside, just a little crack here or there, ended up being an enormous fix uh, because something had penetrated, water had penetrated the building without anybody knowing it. So you have to look at these things. You've got to have somebody look at it for you. You don't want to take a guess and then have a $90,000 bill. Some of the physical verifications we look at for industrial and warehouse, we want to make sure the utility coming in is sufficient because it's quite expensive to try and run uh, three phase down a street. You want to make sure that the, that the floor loads, the thickness of the concrete is sufficient for whatever you're going to be driving into that building. You want to make sure the interior clear ceiling heights uh, between any structural components like ducts and sprinklers are high enough that you can get in what you need to get in. I've had situations where an owner said, oh, it's a 26 foot ceiling. And I repeat that to the client. Oh, it's a 26 foot ceiling. Client eyeballs and says, oh, it looks good to me and tries to bring his first piece of equipment in, which is 24 feet and it hits the beam. You have to verify what's the spacing between columns and what's the dock height. And if there are dock levelers you need. And then we look at environmental due diligence. We've had a lot of fun with this over the years because unfortunately it leads to a lot of huge problems. Sometimes we do environmental testing like phase ones and phase twos, and I'll explain those. We do soil tests in that property in Allentown that collapsed. A nice load bearing test, a compaction test would have been uh, sufficient to make sure we could find out whether or not there was something that could have collapsed that building ahead of time. What are the drainage? What are the, uh, are there any groundwater contamination issues? Um, we had a situation a few years ago, which um, I might be actually legally restricted from talking about, but a neighboring commercial property was buying a neighboring commercial property and did soil tests and determined that there were toxic chemicals under the property they were buying. And they tried to renegotiate because of the expensive cleanup with our client. And that uh, led us to doing some investigation and finding out that the toxins were actually not coming from our property. They were coming from the buyer's property and leaching under ours and that they were actually responsible for it. 
Critical habitats, endangered species can sometimes completely stop any project. And by the way, I, I get a kick out of this sometimes. You know, it seems like every time we're doing a project, they find some sort of endangered frog or turtle somehow on the property. It's amazing. I, I could swear to you there are people driving around with these endangered frogs and turtles in the car, tossing them out the windows at anything that is looking like a real estate project. Because if there really were that many endangered frogs and turtles in every real estate project in the, in the country, how could they be endangered? That's my thinking anyway. Uh, hydrological tests, we want to look at runoff and water flows, and not in uh, eastern Pennsylvania or New Jersey, but when we're looking at the West Coast, uh, seismic tests, earthquake vulnerability, and sometimes, like in Miami, archaeological or prehistoric ruins uh, to check for that. Now, first, we start with what's called a phase one. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's really just a visual inspection and then a lot of research of the history in Harrisburg um, and at the county level, the state level, and every place else. But environmental issues can significantly limit the asset's intended use. For example, you can't build within so many feet of wetlands. So if you're planning on expanding a building or building a certain spot, you may be limited in what you can do. So in a phase one, an environmental engineer or geologist goes and researches the history of the property, looks for adjacent parcels for any record of any environmental contamination that's happened in the past. And the engineer also does a visual inspection to check if there are any obvious issues. And I'll show you some of those. Uh, phase one obvious issues may include pipes sticking out of the ground that may be old buried oil tanks. I have had probably two dozen over the years where I've brought the owner back out and said, what is that pipe sticking up? I don't know. It's been here since I bought the property. Uh, maybe an air vent? And it turns out that there's a buried oil tank under the ground. I've seen that probably two dozen times. Uh, remediation of contaminated soil has absolutely bankrupted companies. If we get past a phase one, <coughs> sometimes we get into an environmental site assessment, which is a phase two. And that includes testing of the soil and the groundwater to look if there's any contaminants, see if there's anything there. Now, here's one we ran across where the owner did not know that there was an oil tank. And it was right behind the building uh, with a small pipe sticking up and clearly a problem. And we've had situations where there were significant cleanups that have had to happen because of leaking oil tanks in a property. This is a similar situation uh, that uh, just about bankrupted a farmer on the western part of the United States. Uh, John Duarte uh, was the third or fourth generation farmer on a, pro on a property in California. And this particular person, uh, had a piece of land that was being farmed for wheat um, for most of the 1970s and 80s. In the 90s, it switched over to cattle. And then in the early 2000s, he went back to wheat. Well, at some point, he brought in a quadratic ripper and leveled the spot, which, they, which gets ha happens very often, to replant seed. And the uh, Army Corps of Engineers saw him doing that. and nailed him for disturbing wetlands. Now he doesn't actually have permanent wetlands. What he has are these called ver vernal pools. We get them sometimes in parts of Pennsylvania as well, which is why I'm mentioning it. If you see on the left-hand side, the little uh, areas that are wet, the ground is heavy clay. So when you have heavy rains all at once, sometimes you get this ponding effect that can last for several weeks or maybe a couple of months. Those are called vernal pools. Because of those pools, those pockets that rainwater fills up, the Army Corps of Engineers declared that to be wetlands and actually fined him $2.8 million for disturbing those wetlands to plant uh, hay on the property that had had hay planted on it since at least the early 70s. And he was nailed for that. That's the type of thing that you can run into even if you've never had a problem in the past. And then one of the final things is a market feasibility study. And I won't uh, bore you to tears with this too much, but you may have a client who wants to buy a, an apartment complex and update it. You might have a client who wants to buy an office building for investment or a retail shopping center, or you might have a client who wants to buy a small freestanding commercial building where they want to put their business. Maybe they want to open a real estate office and they want to put their business right there or a coffee shop or a gym or a restaurant. A gym's not a good idea right now since they're not allowed to be opened a spa, an entertainment center, maybe a nightclub. Um, maybe they want to renovate a hotel 
or maybe they have a land parcel where they want to build a commercial investment project. No matter what they're looking at doing with a particular property, if they're trying to invest in it, you want to make sure that they actually can do it. And this is where you may also, as a real estate professional, if you have the experience and the skill, maybe able to collect additional fees, especially if you have an appraisal license. We want to look at who our target market is, or we may want to hire somebody to do this market feasibility study. Who is our target market for our business? If we're going to open a coffee shop, who's our target market for that coffee shop? If we're going to open a real estate company, who's our target market? What are their needs? What's the demographic around it? And I'll show you some examples of some failures in a minute. What would attract them to our building or our project? And we want to look at what we're competing against. It's not the reality that if you build it, they will come. You have to be able to price it accordingly. Just like if you have a colonial in the middle of a neighborhood of colonials, it has to be priced similar to other colonials to sell. What are the current rental rates of competing space in the market? What's the vacancy rate there? What are the current uh, supply of sales in the area? Uh, what uh, supply of existing competitive properties are there? And what's planned? What's being built right now or in the process of being planned that might compete with you in the future? So you want to look at what's coming so that you can pr prepare for it and make something that's going to work. And sometimes we get caught off guard and values change significantly overnight. Now, there, uh, this is, of course, for those of you who are familiar with Allentown, the uh, Allentown Improvement Zone, the NIZ zone. And uh, it looks like a big gray blob with areas cut out because it only affected certain buildings and not all buildings. That doesn't look very fair now, does it, now looking at it? There was a, a uh, competing commercial broker to me who had a property on West Maple that was 14,000 square feet that was uh, 11 feet outside of the NIZ zone because he was uh, uh, cut out of that NIZ zone. He had four tenants, 14,000 square feet, paying $14 per square foot. Had a nice return on the building. When the NIZ zone opened, because they had so much free rent, they had so many um, tax benefits to being in the NIZ zone, all of his tenants left, moved across the street into another building and emptied his out. And in order to get people into a building outside the NIZ zone that close, the space would have to be rented by closer to $8 per square foot. The expenses don't go down, but it decreased the value of the building by about two thirds. That's the type of effect that something outside can have on a building. If you're looking at buying something and there's something happening in the region that may directly impact your building, you better know about it. You need to understand that or somebody's going to end up in a lawsuit later. Incidentally, this competing broker from another firm ended up ultimately uh, retiring, listing the building with us and we did sell it. But of course, it sold for a lot less than it would have a year before because of the NIZ zone. And unfortunately, because of kickbacks and some other issues, that sent the mayor of Allentown to prison, which is a shame because I used to have him come and speak at events and he was a lot of fun other than possibly uh, uh, getting money from other people. So market feasibility, the real challenge is estimating and predicting future market conditions. Um, we all know the, the crashes that happened in 1988, uh, slightly in 2001, and then of course dramatically in 2007 and eight. We want to prepare for that, make sure that what we're buying isn't going to go under. So a market feasibility study has to determine how much the future market conditions need to improve to make the project work or how much they can deteriorate before the project is unsuccessful. Let me give you an example. There are a lot of real estate agents right now that are opening, opening their own brokerages. It's happening all over the place because the market has been pretty good the last two and a half, three years. And some agents who didn't experience that 2008 crash like some of the other ones in, in uh, the area did um, and have come into the business since are making $150,000, $200,000 a year and thinking, well, this is easy. I can do this. By the way, I was that person before the 1988 crash. So you open a real estate company figuring that I will always make this much money and anything on top of that from people I hire is gravy. So I'll be able to make this work based on my income. And then you experience 2008 and suddenly the market sales drop by 40% and it doesn't matter how good you are, your $120,000 income is now 70. And that becomes a significant problem for maintaining a business. That happens in every industry. Let's look at the hotel industry. In 2001, the hotel industry died because of 9-11. People stopped flying, people stopped going out. 
Now let's bring it forward to the quarantine. I would hate to own a, a hotel today because they're empty and they've been empty since around March 6th. And they may continue to be empty for a long period of time. And I don't know that the occupancy rates are going to come back anytime soon. Now that's something you can't predict, but you can try and look at the typical things that are happening in an area. You can't predict a, a, a pandemic, but you can try and predict what's happening in the marketplace. Look at historic prices in the area and how they've gone up. And I'm not talking about the last two or three years. I'm looking at 10 or 15. Look at the type of neighborhood. Compare the, the comparable prices of buildings that are similar. Look at the employers nearby. Um, are they going to continue to support a building like this? The employment statistics, transportation and traffic, amenities in the area, and school ratings all make a particular location work for somebody. If you've ever noticed, Dunkin' Donuts tends to be located on the right side of the street heading toward employment centers. And this is one of the classic examples, but it's a good one. They do that because people don't want to make a left-hand turn into a Dunkin' Donuts in the morning to get coffee. But on your way to the large uh, manufacturing facilities, office buildings, office parks, they're on the right-hand side because they can pull in and out easily. They've figured that out over the years. Location is important. Let me give you a quick example. This is a, a real-world example that we're um, changing the names of to protect the guilty. So a developer wanted to build two really beautiful 48,000 square foot office buildings next to each other, an area that didn't have them. This was in a suburban market that you're probably familiar with. And the suburban market was not a major city like Philadelphia, but um, close enough that um, it attracted a lot of people who worked in the city and uh, still maintained their homes outside. So it's along a, a location, a busy street, like a highway type setup where along that street, there are commercial buildings that are one story. There's a high school, there's a car dealer, there are some strip malls, there are a couple of real estate offices, but they're almost all one floor. There's no larger buildings. So this developer thought this is the perfect spot to put two big 48,000 square foot buildings, four floors in each, 12,000 square feet per floor, and they'd rent each floor to an individual tenant. They didn't break it up to actually have smaller units in it. It was the largest speculative office project ever proposed in the area, and they felt if they built this beautiful building, it would stand out, you'd see it from everywhere, and tenants would come. But they didn't. The problem is that they were building general purpose offices. There was no special plumbing or equipment for medical or laboratory. I still say today, had they put in water for medical offices, it would have worked, because I think uh, doctors would have uh, moved into it. The customers, because somebody had to take a 12,000 square foot floor, <laughs> the customers, the office users would have had to be somebody with at least 25 employees. So that's accounting businesses, finance, insurance, maybe real estate brokers, maybe engineering consultants, computer services, and so on. Somebody who's got at least 25 employees who wants to be in a nice office building. That's what we need. Um, already within the area, there were uh, very few large offices. Almost all of them were in the city about half an hour away. Customers in the area wanted street exposure. They wanted easy parking. Uh, larger, because as a real estate company, I'd like to have a sign out front. As an insurance agent, I'd like to have a sign out front. As Dunkin' Donuts, I want to be in a separate building. That's small firms. Large firms, employees want easy commute, and they want to be uh, close to other support services. And again, we're limited to employers that have more than 25 employees. Now, a lot of times people will build something thinking that their lower office rents will attract attention. Um, one good example is Jersey City. Uh, you see it also in Hoboken. In the Jersey side of, uh, the, of the Hudson, there are a lot of office buildings going up. And I was at a meeting in Manhattan, this is maybe a year and a half ago, but I was at a meeting in Manhattan with, um, well, I won't tell you the, the firm I was with, but the, the large real estate brokerage was talking about what impact all the new buildings would be having in the Manhattan market. The Hudson Yards project is going up, the New World Trade Center buildings, and one Vanderbilt are creating a lot of space in the city. And somebody brought up the question, well, there's all this space going up just down the train line on the other side of the Hudson. You can see all these buildings going up, and they are much, much cheaper than Manhattan. How's it going to affect us? And it's funny because the consensus of the room was, well, why would we worry about that? Nobody wants to actually work there. They all want to work in Manhattan. 
Now, I disagree with them. But the reality is some people want to be in a central district, dis, business district want to be in the central business district. If we are um, a third of the price or a quarter of the price or a tenth of the price here in the Lehigh Valley market, as in northern, uh, as in uh, Jersey City or as in Manhattan, it doesn't mean that a finance outfit from Manhattan is going to move here for the cheaper rents. It's a different market. We're not competing with that market. We're bringing people in from our own area, unfortunately, for whatever good or bad that is. So our competition is localized. And we want to compete with the general type of space that we're working in. In this case, we were not medical. We were just general. We don't have any competition in the space, but there also apparently weren't very many um, users of that space in that market. So we look at the current and anticipated absorption, we look at new construction being planned, and we try and figure out whether or not our project's going to work. What they should have done in this case was they should have canvassed businesses at 25 or more employees in this suburban market and asked if this building would be attractive. That could also have served as a marketing effort. They didn't do it. They also could have gone to the county business patterns uh, in the Census Bureau and tried to find out whether or not there were enough businesses that could actually move into these spaces. They didn't do that either. Instead, they built the first building. What they would have found was that fewer than 10 firms in the office market segments in that uh, suburban market had 25 or more employees. So this, proper, this project had no chance of uh, actually succeeding because they'd have to have gotten 80% of the office users that had that many employees to leave their current space and move in. So in the actual experience, they did lease two of the floors in the first building and uh, went bankrupt. Never finished the second building. Second example is uh, 800 upscale condos that were going to be, that were planned. Uh, they were gonna have common areas and recreational facilities and upscale condos can work in the right location. Uh, this was several times the size of the typical development in the region. And just looking at what they projected, in order for this project to work, they thought in the first year they'd sell out 75 condos, then they'd sell about 200 to 250 a year, and then blow it out within the first five years because this was like nothing the area had seen before and people would come out of the woodwork and buy them. But when you look at this particular suburban market, all houses being sold in that area were only 1,400 a year. So they'd have to sell 200 of the 1,400 being condos. And that wasn't something that was being sold in the area. And out of that 1,400 per year being sold, about a third of them were either new construction or some sort of condo. So the product they're trying to put together is an upper income, high density condo. We know the customers for this based on the price range is not the top 10% of income earners because they don't buy this type of condo, but they are within the top 30%. So we've got a 20% window. They're small, so they're not traditional families with children at home. We're looking for retirement buyers, empty nesters, single parents, and other adults. And what do customers care about? They want good access to work. They want recreational and social activities. And they want a contemporary design. We've got no competition with this project. There are no comparable projects. So this will be the first one in an area. Here's what they didn't look at. In this particular suburban market, there were 45,000 households. Only 9,000 of those households were between the 70th and 90th percentile of income, which would qualify them to buy this property. Of that 9,000 households, 5,500 of them were traditional families. So our target market is only 4,500 uh, groups that are empty nesters, single parents, or, or unrelated individuals in this whole area. We've only got 4,500 possible target audience members. And we've got to sell out 800 of these. It's a really high percentage. Maybe a smaller project would have worked. But we've got to actually find a way to sell that many units. Now, estimates of all sales of housing, if we try and work it backwards, if there's 1,400 units selling a year, houses selling in the whole suburban market a year, and we're only hitting 10% of the market segment, because if you look back at this, 4,500 people out of 45,000 in the area is 10%. That means about 10% of the buyers are going to fit that category, one of those categories and that's 140 possible sales a year. But the capture rate for any particular type of product is no higher than 20%. So instead of selling 200 units a year, they'd be likely to sell 28, 29, 30 units a year. 
Incidentally, when they built their first building, they didn't sell a single unit to anyone and ended up, of course, going bankrupt again. So we want to look at feasibility. We want to make sure that when we're putting something together, it's really going to work. It's really going to make money. Again, we want to look at the target market. We want to look at the comparable properties and advantages of each. Uh, what are the risks and can they be controlled? Uh, what's the uh, discounted cash flow on an absorption schedule? We want to look at the market area and define it. And I'm going to cut through a lot of this because um, I, I've gone on pretty long as it is now. But some things we can look at on a GIS model. If you've ever seen one of these, um, CCIM has one uh, called Site to Do Business. Uh, Esri, I think, is free. You can actually pinpoint everything around a particular property and try and figure out driving distances, what's close by, what the demographics are, what the average income range is. There's so much data online right now that we can utilize to figure out whether or not a project works. It's fantastic. We can look at where a buyer is likely to come from or a tenant is likely to come from. We can actually do projections pretty easily, but we wanna make sure we know what the vacancy rate is of the property we're looking to buy, what the possible market rent is, and whether or not there's more new construction coming in that's gonna compete with us. And then we can analyze supply and demand, try and figure out what's gonna work and what's not. And for example, if you're looking at an area and you're trying to build in an area where you uh, just have large corporate manufacturing facilities, you're in one of the regions that's just big manufacturing facilities, there's usually less need for multi-tenant office buildings. If you're in a city that is uh, like the Lehigh Valley, uh, where there are highways and railroads that come together, or where you're at uh, Philadelphia or uh, uh, Southern Jersey, where you've got the ports, deep water ports, and mail ra major rail switching lines, that's where you're gonna see a lot of warehousing and distribution centers being built. If you're in a tourist attraction like uh, LA or Orlando, you're gonna have far more of a need of hotel rooms. So you look at what's actually gonna work in a particular area, you look at the consumer demographics, again, without boring you to tears, we uh, look at the household characteristics. We want to make sure that we're building the right product for the right buyers. Millennials these days are moving to Manhattan. They're moving to Miami. They're going to the gateway cities. And part of the reason for that is, unlike some of us that are older, they don't see themselves working for the same company for 35 years. They see themselves working there for two years and then laterally transitioning up the ladder to another company. And they have to be in a, a major market like Manhattan in order to do that where there's a lot of the same types of jobs from different companies. And they don't find that necessarily in the suburban markets. On the flip side, baby boomers tend to be in suburban markets and moving toward that. So maybe in some of the suburban markets where we have an average age that's a little bit older, we wanna look at developing uh, 55 plus communities or looking to invest in 55 plus communities. If we're looking at uh, tiny housing, maybe we'll look at the major cities for that. We look at household income, uh, we analyze the supply, and I'm not going through each of these in detail because it'll just uh, bore you to tears, but we want to gauge the demand and supply and try and figure out what building permits are being done. We map the competition if we're really looking at it. We look at the visibility of a project. We look at the ingress and egress, what are the positives and negatives of any location. We compare it with the competition to try and figure out if we can capture the income rate, the rental rate that we expect. We look that we have enough parking. Uh, building amenities can be very important. There are some buildings in the region that have on-site daycare center and they're able to get a higher rate uh, from other tenants in the building because they've got on-site daycare or on-site fitness center, which both of which you can't use, unfortunately, in a quarantine zone. And we look at absorption rates to try and figure out how we're going to make this work. And then finally, there's also community support, making sure that we don't have those not my backyard people coming out and trying to uh, stop us from going forward with putting into a building what we think should be in that building. And again, for those of you who want it, if you want to send me an email, uh, this is a checklist that we have put together on different parts of the, um, uh, the uh, due diligence process, building inspections, uh, what you need for the loan, and so on. You can send me an email at uh, real estates with S, real estates next level at gmail.com, and I'll be happy to get you a copy of that uh, due diligence checklist so that you have one. I am gonna open it up. If anybody has any questions at all about anything, I will be happy to try and um, answer any questions that you might have, just in case anybody's got one. And I'll hang on for a minute, just in case. I know that was a lot of material and a lot of it is kind of technical all at once, but uh, hopefully gave you some decent uh, information to get you started. 
And with your due diligence checklist, hopefully you'll be able to uh, use that for some of your commercial investment transactions and try and keep yourself out of trouble with the transaction. Any questions?